so we're podcasting in the truck, and I guess this is a small backstory. Woke up this morning, and kind of our strategy where we're hunting right now has been wake up and start glassing. Yeah. Camping <sighs> on public land, and woke up this morning, and I was making our coffee that's still just sitting here. We got a little wet spot, we got the jet boil burner, got the Folgers aroma Got seal. enough grounds on the center council to make another cup, probably. <laughs> But I'm sitting here, and I had just walked over and woke Jake up, and it's just gray light, and I was glassing around. And my actually my first glass. I did you actually up. come over there and wake me up, or did you just call me? No, I walked over. I don't remember that at really? all. Really? No. It was it, you'd acted weird. I was like, "Is he dead?" <laughs> <laughs> like usually you laugh at something I say, and uh-huh. I said something goofy like I always do, and you just like didn't do anything. I was yeah. like, "I don't remember it at all." Jake. <laughs> and then you made some sort of groan. But anyway, I came back over here, and I could barely see through the, like, mist of the jet boil, you know, condensating on the windshield, and I saw a big buck over here, and I'm like, oh, shoot, man, so I called Jake, and and that buck was on public, and then, I, to be honest, we kind of forgot about that, mm-hmm. but in the meantime, I called Jake, he doesn't answer, just trying to be like, hey, like, you know, look alive, don't just hop out and, you know, make a ruckus, and I look over to my left, and there's another big buck on top of the hill pushing what I thought was a doe. Learned that that's another whitetail buck. Then I look up on top of the hill, and the biggest whitetail then is with a doe. Here we are like two hours later, and they're still up there. And we got ourselves in a weird situation here where we've got a lockdown buck with a doe, and they're about 200 yards from public land. Mm-hmm. Called the landowner. He... I don't know. He said he's got a bunch of hunters coming in today, actually. So, which, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, what we're doing is is just trying to keep eyes on them, and I feel like what greater timing and you know, I guess timing would be the word for our annual lockdown podcast yeah. with Zach and Jake. <laughs> a literal lockdown podcast. Yeah, we are locked down. They're, we, these deer are going to stand up and be doing stuff while we're talking to you guys and talking to each other so it'll be interesting to see and hopefully what all happens yeah hopefully you're enjoying some footage yeah laying over the top of all oh, there'll this be too. footage there's already tons and tons of footage yeah it's it, in, it's it's interesting especially in open country like this where it's i mean you can observe everything they're doing i mean saw buck satellite and all around these deer this morning and now he's kind of got it cleared out to where it's just him and the doe he, we, we almost shot one of the satellite <laughs> bucks just Coming like Zach was had to get out of the car and we thought he might follow this fence line fifteen yards from us. He was doing it for a while, but then he eventually jumped jumped over and crossed onto the private. But he's kind of pushed all the other deer away and now we just had a coyote come in earlier and we're watching him like the doves, you can tell she's exhausted, the bucks exhausted, they they'll lay their chins flat on the ground and go to sleep for a while. It's just really interesting to observe. Yeah, I think it it's just funny that uh yeah, you get to see how the other bucks respond too. Like, you know, the the two other bucks were satelliting for a while, and by satellite, I, I read a comment recently that was asking about like, what does that mean? And, and essentially, a satellite is just a buck that is hanging around. Yeah. So like, I think the original term was uh, started with elk. Mm-hmm. Where you get a satellite bull, so you've got a herd bull with his harem of cows. Satellite bull. Is just hanging around trying to get his chance usually they're younger but they can also be big bucks or bulls too yeah. and, and actually, there was a big one down there yeah this morning. yeah there was a big there was another mature buck you know that was satelliting but he eventually he was the first one to bail out and what he did was bed down for a little bit and kind of seemed like he caught his wind and then he took off cruising but i think what's interesting is uh when you see that other buck take off cruising, it's like, it just goes to show how badly they want a doe this time of the yeah. year. And like, when you hit it right, when everything's kind of peeking out, and we're just about to that mm-hmm. time, I think it's, what, the 9th or the 10th? Mm-hmm. Ninth. Is it the 9th? Or no, it's the 10th. It is the 10th. Yeah, so now we're in the double digits of November, and this is when things start getting real crazy, and this is a great example of that, because he's locked down. Yeah. But... 
And who knows how long he's been with her for. He's, it, it, they're kind of acting like they've been running together for a while. It's like the satellite bucks kind of seem like they've got all that sorted out. You know, there's probably a, a bunch of different things that went on throughout the night last night and maybe even all day yesterday and the day before. It's like maybe them posturing up and even fighting each other over who gets to stay with her. And it's just, it, you've, we've seen it in all different phases and it, it seems like it usually lasts for a couple of days. Dylan Hazen. We'll talk to him a different time. <laughs> that other buck sticking around, I, I I think I've heard the MSU Deer Labs guys talk about how uh, usually a, a hot dog get bred by several different bucks, and that's kind of what it seemed like that uh, that smaller guy was doing, was just hanging around. It's like maybe this this buck will breed her a couple times, and then he'll be like, all right, on to the next one. And then that other, that, that other dude will slip in and get his chance, and he probably knows that. Or he runs a different buck off, meaning the biggest one. Maybe he runs a different buck off, and then all of a sudden the doe is separated from him, and then he slides up in there, which I've heard that with elk, too. Similar deal where, like, the big bull, herd bull, gets just tired to where he's just not paying enough attention. He's got all these cows running around him, Mm -hmm. and the little one gets in there and, you know, does his deal, too. But I guess one of the things that, I find interesting, even after, you know, several years of talking about it now and just showing people videos of it, I guess, is just still the hesitation of the lockdown. Like, what does that mean? You know, what what it, it means to most hunters, it seems like, is a, is a bad thing. And it's just interesting because... It's my favorite time yeah. of year to hunt. I mean, it's, I mean, you have to find them, but when you find them, they're, it's... it's uh, it's a very fun time to try I to sneak to, in there I, close to them. And I hate to use the word easy because there's still tons of things that can go wrong, but it's the easiest time to get a big mm-hmm. buck. Yeah. I mean, they're just so foolish, and I find it interesting when I like see other content pieces and stuff of people talking about this time of the year. It's like this dreaded time frame, and then when it's observed, it's like it's just passed along as like, ah, you know, this target with her, buck, we can't yeah. do anything. Right. And and I think Jake and I just view it so differently. And I, I'm going to try to have this conversation go from like a d- bunch of different directions, I suppose, like based off of different style, because in our style, and I think that even if this isn't your style, you should consider it is just or go if you, or if you have an opportunity, like say you're sitting and you're in a good funnel, which is a, another great option to do during lock, is like one of the two good options I mm-hmm. feel like. And maybe I'm missing something, but either you can get in a good funnel where a deer, like the one we just saw, that just he didn't get the doe, so he's just cruising. Mm-hmm. There's probably a specific spot you could pick somewhere throughout this landscape that you know there's a good chance he's going to cruise through, mm-hmm. and just sit that for seven days straight, and you're probably going to get a chance if you're in a, if you're in a decent area, you know. And, uh, but that's just, that ain't, <laughs> that ain't what we're probably going to do. No. We just, we're not really all day sitters and <laughs> especially Dude, when you're like two hour sitters. Yeah. Especially when you're in an area where you got a bunch of different ground to work with. Mm-hmm. It's like, you can just keep moving until you find the rut basically. But on the other hand, one thing that I think about and a great example of this was when we just did, I guess the last podcast, which would have been the rut stories part two. So Ben was hunting my grandpa's property, and that was an 80-acre chunk. Him and my brother had checked a trail camera, had seen that this buck appears. This is a sign that the lockdown is happening in this area, and it was right about these dates. I think he ended up shooting that buck on the 9th. And I think, thinking of it that way, it's like, okay, buck appears. And we were just talking with Jake's, Jake and my buddy, uh, Aaron Zimmerman and he was talking about not being aggressive enough sometimes and like I think something that happens is and and just using him as an example let's say you see that buck come in and you think well I don't want to mess it up he's here I want him to stay here well he may not even be there for two or three days even yeah so it's like that's your time to strike and be aggressive and like there's different ways you can be aggressive. Our style is to just move in on the ground, grunt, try to sound like another buck because during the lockdown they're so defensive and like 
I mean, we just watched that buck run a coyote off. Yeah. And, you know. They're, yeah, they're, that was cool. We'll have to drop the footage and it's like, oh, this might get interesting. Yeah. And I think we probably both figured what was going to happen, but it was just cool to see it. It's like the doe got up and she's just like, oh, shit, let's get out of here. And he's just like, nah, honey, we got it. <laughs> and then eventually he convinced, like, they both were just, like, kind of trotting after him, running him off. It was, it was kind of funny. The coyote, you could t- tell he he saw them before the deer saw the coyote. And he's just like, oh, here, here might be a quick meal. And then all of a sudden the buck got up and the coyote rethought everything. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll just scoot over here. <laughs> but when you're when you're making these moves, I mean, we've talked about it before where you get in tight and they don't even know what you are, but whitetails are so aggressive. Just the nature of them in comparison to like, you know, other animals that when they've got that doe, they're so defensive that they'll go after a predator like the coyote or even like the situation where um, I was hunting with Grant in 2019 and spotted a buck better with a doe, snuck in tight to him. I slid up on the bank and I knew that at some point he would see me, and he was sitting there kind of looking. If I was over here, he was looking this direction, and I saw him kind of do a, and look right, you know, right at me. And instead of freaking out, which they would do at a non-lockdown time of the, of the season, like if you do that on October 15th on a bedded buck, he's probably less likely he might be curious, but he's not going to just all of a sudden be like, I have to, I have to get whatever that is yeah. out of here. Like, and, and that's what he did. He yeah. stood up and all his hair stood up and he just started posturing up. And to be honest, you I didn't have did, a decoy, nothing. No. It's just your head sticking there. Yeah. And I, and I kind of knew he was going to do that. I mm-hmm. mean, you just see it enough times in examples like this where you watch a buck get really defensive over that doe. Oh, she's standing up. Uh oh. Guys, this could be huge. We might cut this podcast real short, <laughs> turn it into a hunting video. <laughs> eh. Till he's up, I'm not worried about it because she's probably just going to browse around a little bit. And just spin around and lay back down. Eh, she's going to lay right back down, huh? No. Nope. But I think... I guess to keep the conversation going here, like, oh, he's up. Mm-hmm. Maybe the conversation can't keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you know a buck's locked down in your area, like you're, whether you're picking him up on camera or you, you're getting a visual, which I think is ideal. Like, let's say you're in a in a morning setup and you watch a buck you know, across the field or even through the open timber, like follow a doe or chase off other bucks. You're seeing that real chase kind of crazy action, multiple bucks around. Generally to me, that means you're about to witness of the lockdown. Like that one buck's trying to get himself isolated. You know, chasing does is one thing or bumping does around, but the actual like buck being defensive and trying to fight off those other bucks bucks is a good you know visual cue to say and also like corralling the doe like Mm -hmm. i feel like a a big buck like that they're they'll bird dog and stuff but when they're hot they'll they're gonna try to force them to go places too which is kind of interesting to see yeah and i think over the years we've just started to realize what well and and i I always have to give credit to justin zyme because he's the one that really got my attention on this is he had talked about how he believed that bucks pushed does into areas where other bucks couldn't get downwind of them easily. And that has been a consistent theme of this lockdown phase where the big bucks are taking the doe into a position where it's really hard for other deer to even find them in the first place. So that's where you see them popping up in weird spots like up, up against a highway or just a road in general. Body of water. Body of water is a big river, lake, up against old, like, abandoned homestead. Or even just houses I've seen, like, in Wisconsin, you know, just, like, somebody's yard, if it's got decent cover by it. Um, Like farm equipment, stuff that they can lay in a weird spot. I've seen them, you know, the line of power lines, Mm -hmm. the big big 
contraptions that you see there. I've seen them lay right underneath those with those. Out before. in open fields. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little swale. And that's where we're spending more time when we're looking for deer in the lockdown, looking in oddball places that we would never look for a buck. I mean, I'm sit catching myself glassing stuff that it's like, I would never glass here. I mean, why would you ever glass where these deer are right now? Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, you're just throwing your glass up in these random places, like maybe a little f uh, finger of a drainage in a field, like a waterway or something. Mm -hmm. Any tiny little bit of cover, because other bucks are looking for that hot doe. He knows that. So if he puts something downwind of him and that doe, it's going to make it really challenging for other bucks to find him. Um, Basically, they'd, they'll just have to trail their scent to where they're at instead of just cruising downwind and then just, you know, walking straight up into the wind to find them. They're, they're basically having to just trail the deer, which, I mean, they can easily do. It's just kind of eliminates the buck cruising 400 yards downwind of them and mm -hmm. being like, oh, there, there they are. They just bedded right. back down. So I think a lot of times what you're going to see, too, is like those deer will get into a position where they feel like their downwind side is safe and then they'll watch their back trail. They'll just lay there and watch where they walk from and the big buck is just waiting to defend. So that just opens up, in my opinion, like a ton of opportunity as a hunter to just get pretty dang reckless. I mean, <laughs> reckless. Mm -hmm. No joke when I think of lockdown buck. Like if, if we had permission right now, we'd put the wind in our favor first get into a spot where we felt like we could, you know, just basically get to where we could just see the tops of his tines and probably just grunt and have a decoy in front of us and yeah. saddle up, partner, because he's coming in. Like, he's not going to just run away from that. Being a whitetail, at least, yeah. it just doesn't happen. Or it feels like sometimes with elk, for example, you mm -hmm. bugle and they just want to go the other way. In this situation... I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's like that's his only doe that he's got right now. He's going to protect her at all costs, even if it's a, a buck, a, a dog, a human, you know. Yeah. They, they, they don't see, like, I think about that one that uh, Ted missed that time where we saw him from the boat. Yep. Ted, shoot, like, we grunted, raked a little bit, and all of a sudden he's coming up out of there. And Ted shoots at him, misses, and then the deer, the buck, big buck, runs straight downwind of us. He's standing up there 40 yards, still within range. There's just some brush in the way. And he's just sitting up there, like, stomping, trying to and trying to get the hit, because his doe was still down by the water. Like, and he wasn't going to leave without her. He's sitting there straight downwind to two guys. <laughs> no other time of year would he do this. He's just sitting there, and he starts blowing, like, trying to get her attention. Eventually... She doesn't come up there, so he just makes a big loop around, goes all the way around us, scoops her up, and then takes off again. It's like pretty much at all costs. It seems like they're gonna they're gonna leave with that doe. It's it's pretty pretty crazy. And even this is an open country situation where we probably would want a decoy. But if you're hunting in timber or you got a little bit of cover, you don't need the decoy either. You just get yeah. into a spot where you got terrain or enough thick cover where you can just make buck noises. And I mean there's a good chance they're going to come check you out eventually if you get within whatever that bubble is. And another thing we like to do this time of the year, if we haven't got the visual on them necessarily, is just cruise ourselves like a buck. Yeah. We've had a lot of good action doing that as well where we're just sneaking around because if that buck's locked down with a doe and he hears another deer coming in, like there's a good chance he's going to give you some sort of sound, whether it be he, he's going to grunt or he's going to start scraping, raking a tree, whatever it may be. There's no time of year that they're trying to be louder than right now. Mm -hmm. Either they're just trying to make themselves seem as big as possible, like you said. So if you're stopping enough and listening, like you're probably going to hear them coming in because they're going to want you to hear them coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's trying to intimidate by sound, mm -hmm. intimidate that other deer. Like if, if I'm coming through here, I think speaking from his perspective, if you'll allow me to, <laughs> is he's coming through there just thinking, yeah, so yeah. Then you want to fight this? Hayden, Hayden got some pretty good footage of that one yeah. that I shot last year. Like right as he's coming through, there's a stick that his antler gets caught on, and he just goes like that with his antler and just like rakes through it. It's it's cool. Yeah, there's <laughs> there, there's not much that's cooler than, than that just uh -huh. because I think when – you know, a lot of times we think of the rut, we think of that chasing, right? We think of that crazy chase and, you know, multiple bucks on, on a 
though. But that's also lockdown, right? Like that's the beginning of that mm-hmm. day of lockdown or three day of lockdown. And it seems to me like most rut strategy is always just revolved around being in a funnel where when that buck leaves that doe after two or three days, he's likely to pass through that cruising to the next one. Mm-hmm. And and that clearly works. Like there's so many examples yeah, I mean, it's of wor- it's pro- That's probably the most most used and there's probably more deer killed that way than any any way during the rut Mm -hmm. but if if that's not if you're not into sitting in the same spot over and over again for a lot of days straight this is another option for for you to try i guess Mm -hmm. and i think if you are worried about doing it the best thing that you can do is just try to remember the fact that if he's here today he may not be here tomorrow. So like we were talking to Tyler Mm -hmm. the other day and he was talking about how the buck that he was seeing or he has been seeing is not finding a doe. He wants to find a doe, but he's not finding one. He's on a pattern right now. It seems like he's just, there is does around and he's just checking them and they're not ready yet. And then yesterday, actually, he sent me Snapchat videos of like, that buck, a different buck, and the doe's just bedded out in the middle of the field, so mm. they're locked down. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> right it's Right by switched. that waterway that he was talking about yeah. sitting in. So yeah. it's like, so it's like, to me, th- that pattern isn't going to last for forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, any time of the year that you find a pattern, in my opinion, there's a certain point where you just want to strike on it. And I'm not saying being super crazy reckless at all times, but when you have this lockdown situation, mm-hmm. They may not be there tomorrow. Like I always think of being in a tree stand and looking down through there and, you know, into the marsh or up on the ridge or whatever the situation may be or in the, in the mountain laurel Mm -hmm. does not matter what it is. If you're watching that happen right now, there's a dang good chance you're not going to watch it happen tomorrow. So it's like get the wind in your favor and start yeah, working think about it how many times it. i mean that's always what you're hoping for or I, I i remember having that same situation you're talking about happens like oh this stand was crazy yesterday then you go in the next day and it, i mean almost every time it's just dead mm-hmm. there's nothing going on yep but <laughs> i think i think talking about that situation tyler had is pretty interesting too because it, it's like that's like a like a core area buck i guess it's like that that deer was living there and then he was just keeping tabs on those does for, uh, Tyler said, three days in a row he did the same thing. He wasn't, he wasn't like, locked down with the doe, but he would go on the same route. And he was just, uh, he, I'm assuming he just knew that the, the, one of those does were close. And that's why it was so consistent. He's, like, just hanging around waiting for mm-hmm. her to pop, basically. And then after three days of him doing the same thing, it's like, there he is, locked down out on the field with, with several other bucks around. And then after he's done lo- being locked down with that doe, there's a good chance that thing's just going to go for a couple mile run until he finds the, the next mm-hmm. hot doe, unless there's another one nearby, which in that spot, the deer density isn't super high. So there is a good chance that that buck's just going to be gone after whatever, whatever span that is. So it, I think, you know, you could maybe play it safer for the first couple of days in that situation, but at a certain point you got to make your move because there's a good chance he's just going to switch. Yeah. Be, I mean, just be somewhere something. else with a, a different doe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, to another strategy this time of the year is patterning the doe. Like, if you aren't getting visuals necessarily, you know, kind of almost going back to just hunting deer because he's going to follow her wherever mm-hmm. she goes. So this might be situations where if you do have a food plot or something, especially for, you know, your your morning and evening setups, it's like those are going to be good spots where those does come in because that might be the first and only time he walks through that area. Now, that's very much not our style because we don't generally hunt in places like that. But, you know, if that is your situation, I know that that happens too. Like, for example, that buck that Ben shot that day on November 9th, 2015. What I remember about that and being interesting is, is he watched the buck make a circle and hit two different food plots that my grandpa had planted back in there. And like, first off, that buck specifically, we hadn't seen him. If it's the one that we think it is, we hadn't seen him for two years, let alone in that food plot in daylight, Mm -hmm. you know. So the fact that he just followed those does, which is a consistent pattern. Like at that time, I remember seeing a lot of does frequent that food plot but they weren't 
they weren't necessarily bringing bucks with them until they were locked down with one. So like that, you know, it can be, it's almost like you dial it, you dumb it down a little bit. It's like, just go to where the does are frequenting mm-hmm. this time of the year. Yep. Hunt does more than you're hunting bucks, which just, I think is simplified as hunt where you're seeing a lot of deer often. And I think that, you know, building up to this phase, I've had the best luck or late October, early November by just bouncing around, trying to find as many places with high deer densities as possible. And then as this time of the year starts to like get closer and closer to that lockdown breakthrough, I guess, where the majority of the big bucks are with the does. If you concentrate on those areas, you're just bound to run into the craziness. Like the more, and similar with what I remember hearing Tyler say on the phone with this buck that we were talking about a minute ago. The deer was going out into that field every night because that's where the does were. He maybe wasn't doing that earlier in the he season. <laughs> no, you could see this like a major highway that goes right past. Like you could see him off the major highway. So I, I would assume that that wasn't happening at all pretty much throughout the whole season until the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. So then I guess just one other, one other thing too. It's like... If you watch him go in, like let's say you got a buck that you're hunting, and you watch him go into an area with a doe, like don't don't be anything but pumped. Like yeah. This, in my opinion, is your opportunity to be aggressive. Try your calling. Try your rattling. I mean, do these different tactics, and truthfully, just get in tighter to him. Yeah. Like, if you know I was they're just over say, there. D- don't think like just because you're seeing a deer 200 yards away. If he's with the doe, he's probably yeah, there's a he he might may, maybe try it, but. You're generally you're gonna have to get pretty close to them, and mm. and if you do, there's a good chance it's gonna work. Like mm. it, that it, it's, it's probably worth considering though if you, if if it's something you're sitting in a stand and you're observing happening, get down and <laughs> try to make a move. Don't don't sit there and hope that maybe they'll come come by you unless you got a really good reason to believe that they're going to. Like like you've been seeing them do something, you know, the couple of days before. Mm-hmm. Like for example, I'm thinking. You know, if you can kind of watch into like a marshy area and you watch a big buck follow a doe into there and, you know, the last two days you've seen them come out and come right here in the evening. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, they're in there. You feel confident. I mean, okay. I'm I'm okay with you trying that. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're my buddy, at least mm-hmm. I'm thinking of a buddy on the phone, right? Yeah. It's like if, if they're asking for, you know, an opinion on something, I'm probably going to say, yeah, I would, I would say just set that and wait and mm-hmm. hopefully they do do the same thing. But but if it's Sunday Sunday morning and you can't hunt again until next weekend and you watch something, you know, go back into a bedding area or maybe you can still see them, I'd say don't hope on them being there next Friday or Saturday oh, no. when you can hunt again. No, definitely not. No, that's way too long. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if you're thinking weekend type hunting where you only have two days at a time, I mean, this is ultimate aggressive in my opinion. I mean, you just got to push in there and you got to make those moves. Mm-hmm. And I mean... Again, you got to be smart with every little move that you're making. You can't just this like for example, we're sitting here in the truck cuz we're technically locked down. Like we know <laughs> we can't get out of this truck and just go blasting at the deer. Like by the time I get my bow out of the truck, he's going to be running does up again. Just stood up. Just stood up. But I just think that one example with Ben is a really good one in the fact that he saw that buck, he observed, or he saw him on the camera, he observed the buck actually being with the doe, and then eventually just made the move in there and got super aggressive. And he set up on a funnel close to the bedding area, which is pretty interesting. That's a unique, you know, lockdown tactic. But essentially what happened was, is there was a funnel created by a big boulder, or cliff boulder thing, bluff if you will. And uh, I know all of y'all listening in Wisconsin know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, where that bluff was, that buck had the doe pinned up against there. But that also had created a funnel around that bluff because the deer traveling around it, you know, obviously get pinched down there. And Ben was in a tree stand and at the time, I think he admitted this in that podcast. It's like at the time we weren't thinking about ground hunting like we are right now. 
so like his best option was to sit in the stand yeah and he ended up sitting in the stand and eventually that buck followed that doe they were just working around him all day but eventually they went through that funnel and hey absolutely that works i just think you know again if you're if you're limited on time and in this target buck that you know about if he's a mature buck he's going to play that aggressive game when you get in tight Mm -hmm. and i I just i just want to give people that confidence because i to be honest it i don't know i guess there's good and bad to it is like i if everybody had as much confidence during the lockdown as as we do, maybe there wouldn't be any deer left. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think it's funny that it's it's just interesting to me that people get so like it's like worried you about see, spooking them. Yeah, you want to see a depressed hunter. It's like listen to somebody talk about the lockdown. It's like, dude, what? <laughs> to me, it's just not that way. So I don't know. I mean, I think I'd encourage you to at least try and maybe you try it once and you blow them out of there. It's like, well, I'm never doing that again. But <laughs> Zach honestly, and Jake are stupid. yeah, even even if you just have a close encounter and like if you if you have a buck coming in postured up to you, you're, you're probably going to kind of be losing your mind if you're anything like Zach and I. It's like <laughs> the the most exciting thing that I've had happen in the in the deer woods. And it, it only happens in that like little block of time, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, were they that emotional and that pissed off? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's. I mean, think about it. He's got he's got one one month a year basically to do do what he's uh, do, to doing do. doing right now is pass along his seed. He's gonna get pretty fired up about it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, truthfully, that is the definition of success is reproduction. Uh huh. Like biologically speaking. If he breeds that doe, he's successful. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, I don't know. That's kinda beautiful. Ob- yeah, hey, man. <laughs> wow, science is beautiful. <laughs> and you can tell that these deer are in love at least for the next three, four days <laughs> because they got together and they run that coyote off. The way that they just <laughs> ran that coyote off together, man, gorgeous. He puffed his chest up right in front of that doe. He said, I got a baby girl. And then and she, she threw her tail up like, <laughs> I know we good. <laughs> What what are some tips I I guess like as far as we we're talking about doing it, getting down and moving at him. So like how? I think finding them is the hardest part, mm-hmm. and I, I think uh, I would I would probably underestimate how much ground you might have to cover. You know, if I would have if you had been telling me about this a couple of years ago, it's like I mean we're talking we're driving. Right now we're driving from piece of public land to piece of public land to piece of public land. Sometime we're spending a couple of days ago we were in the truck till noon. Yeah. And before we ever even did driving, anything. walking, boating. I mean, whatever you're doing, running through the woods. I mean, you Cover get, you got to be ground. covering ground. Think about how much ground these deer are covering. And even if you kick some up, I mean, just start moving that direction. Then hopefully they stay on it on the property you can hunt, and they're probably not going to go too far. And that buck's not going to leave that doe. I mean, you you guys have seen it just like kind of what I was talking about with uh, Ted missing that one before. And I know I watched uh, Midwest Whitetail episode where you and Warb basically split up a hot buck and a doe, and like he was eventually come back and was making loops around trying to find where that doe had went. It's like they're n- they're n- probably not going to leave unless you hit them. You know, and even if that's the case, they're probably they're probably gonna. I shot that buck with he, Grant, yeah, and he came back yeah. looking like where. And had I had the decoy ready, he might have came all the way back down in yeah. there. And here he's hit and bleeding, yeah, and standing there. I mean, the buck ended up living through that shot, but it was crazy. It looked like he might not at the time. Mm-hmm. It was like he's bleeding a lot, but he ended up he ended up uh, living until Greg shot him <laughs> with the muscle loader, which is just a wild story. But. Uh-huh. I think when you have a buck locked down, I always think, okay, I'm going to play this safer than I need to to start. And what I mean by that is loop everything wide. Like if you don't have the wind in in your favor or however you're setting up this stalk, it's like start picking cover points that you can kind of hop to. And then just go to those spots and stop. Because you might also be surprised at how far he'll come depending on what the cover and the terrain is like. So uh, I'll use a couple different examples just because they're very, I think, I think they're different in ways, but they're similar too. So 
The first one we'll talk about is the one that you shot in 21 that we spotted off the boat. So in this situation, the wind was coming from dry ground to the water. That buck had the doe pushed pretty close to the water. Mm-hmm. We spotted him from the boat. And right away, I don't think we ever, ever saw the doe until no. after he went down. I think we heard her blow maybe. Mm-hmm. But we never saw the doe. And and I don't know what you call this other than just watching too many deer and just, you know, maybe even just being hopeful. Reading, but reading the situation, reading his body language and I think the situation. Because he turned to the left mm-hmm. and he walked and he just walked with an attitude about him of mm-hmm. like, he might have a doe. And I guess that particular body language was kind of like his head was hanging low mm-hmm. and he just almost seemed like he was showing off. And that's... Yeah. That's kind of what you can observe a lot of times. It seems like they're just, in general, kind of showing Postured off. up. Postured, circling something. Mm-hmm. And uh, even like this buck, we've observed him several times just make a circle around the doe and bed right back down. Mm-hmm. And this kind of seems like what happened when we spotted the one that you shot in 2021. Mm-hmm. It was like we kind of bumped him with the boat. Not bumped him, but we got him up on his feet, and then he immediately just circled this theoretical doe that, mm-hmm. you know, had to have been true in the end because we basically just go over park the boat we start working our way in a satellite buck runs right past jake and i did you ever even see that buck i don't think not you did, till he's did past you? me <laughs> yeah. no. so we're like walking up a trail and this is another good indicator like at this point i think we're like feeling pretty confident but then when this other you know satellite buck just comes flying through and doesn't pay any attention to jake and like happens so fast jake barely gets eyes on him Mm -hmm. it's like okay something weird's going on and and truthfully too i remember getting out of the boat and just smelling deer Mm -hmm. you remember that Mm -hmm. and it was like just constant aroma of deer floating around Uh, not what's happening in here it kind of just smells like urine in here (laughs) because i ain't showered in days god that's disgusting isn't it yeah we smell ripe <laughs> i get in my little my little vehicle it's just a scent chamber at night it's like holy cow i'm glad <laughs> nobody else has to be in here with me so we end up moving down an edge and at this point again we're playing it pretty safe like we're using terrain that drops off into the the water to use that as cover we've got shadows we get the wind in our favor and we're moving from cover to cover so as we're approaching, we're not just like walking across the wide open, standing straight up. A lot of times we're hunkered down, we're staying low. And, and you brought up a good point when we were making a stalk yesterday. Is like, I think now is a good time to get, you know, to crawl. And, and the reason that you crawl is you can stay lower than what you need to be. That way, if he hears you and stands up and looks, you're already kind of looking like a bush. Yeah. You're not necessarily just standing a straight up. Six foot vertical object. Yeah. So I think as you're moving in like that, you're just picking those next pieces of cover and and pretty much planning like a five to 10 yard route to that next spot. And these don't have to be anything crazy because you got to think this lockdown buck, he's, he's essentially drunk. He's not looking at things in the same way that he normally does. He's an angry drunk. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Great point. (laughs) So it's like, as he's scanning, make sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're still rolling. Like as he's still scanning this area if you got a rock if you got a some brush if you got a down tree if you got a big tree whatever it may be that might break you up just enough it's probably going to be enough now if you're going to set up there and and you know catch a cruising buck that's looking for a doe these aren't spots necessarily that you would feel confident in pulling it off but i mean we're talking a fence post at times could Mm -hmm. be enough just something to break up the monotonous look through whatever setting you're in. And this buck in particular that you shot, the first time he came to us, he heard us from a distance and, I mean, came flying in <laughs> and, like, ran over the hill, and he just heard us. And we were yeah. really not making that much noise mm-hmm. even, but he assumed we were another buck, and he came running in. I bet he ran 100 yards yeah. to get over Because it had to just us. happened, that, look, that smaller buck. We just watched yeah. him approach him basically from the same direction. I'm sure he did pretty much the same thing. And he's just like, oh, he's back or another one's back. And I'm sure it's something that he had been doing all day, you know. It's just running other bucks off. So it's just an, it was just another... Another one to run off, in his opinion, but 
He ran over, looked, took one look, coast was clear, and he ran. And, I mean, he, he like, ran so hard that at first we were like, did we spook him <laughs> or did he smell us? And we eventually decided that that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. And we just kept moving up in that direction. And at this point now, we know that we're in danger zone. We know that he can hear us, and we know there's a dang good chance it's going to happen again. So now we really start leapfrogging. Now, granted, you're probably not doing this with two people for the most part, but it's the same concept if you're alone. You're going from one spot to the next, and that's how we were doing it is you would move up, I would move. I think it might have been our first or second move even. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it was like, (laughs) and there's your your, cue with your ears. It's like, okay, he's coming. And I, and you looked up click your GoPro on and it's just like here he's coming right towards us and again drunk and not really looking at anything we have the sun at our back the wind's in our favor number one thing is have the wind in your favor but that buck literally walked to 15 yards of you and you shot him right in the front yeah and, and he never even and was really it. looking at me and I, was, I wasn't crouching I wasn't behind a tree I was standing you know the trees right here I'm standing in front of it the deer's right there and he had never had any idea I was there I don't think and just yeah, unbelievable shot and unbelievable moment in, you know, lockdown rut hunting. Truly, mm-hmm. that was incredible. Yeah. And then uh, the other example that I was going to use was from when we were hunting in uh, the snow last year, Nick and I. We had basically watched this bigger buck go into some cover. And it was super cold. Like, if we're cold today, it was, you know, another... 20, 25 <laughs> degrees colder than With what it snow is right and now. Wind. Yeah, rough. I think it was negative one or zero at that point when we got him. But we had watched this buck go into a patch of cover, and kind of our theory was if we know he's in there, we can probably get him. But if we can specifically know where he's at, like exactly to the yard, then our odds go up significantly. And because of the snow, we figured that we'd be able to walk or drive the perimeter and find tracks if they left so we just kind of tried to keep eyes on it and eventually we're cruising around multiple angles and i really didn't want to go in there without knowing where they were Mm -hmm. really didn't but i kept so i kept doing these weird little put it off like ah we're taking a look Hey, you know let's make one more loop around in the truck and that's ultimately what i said let's just go one more time around and by golly, we came back. We were going to get dropped off on this time through. And I looked over, and I just saw the back of a deer. And that was enough. Even just that would have been enough. But we stopped. I jumped up on the running board, looked over the truck. It's a little buck, and then I watched a bigger buck come out. And I think Nick ended up getting footage of that, too. The bigger buck comes out, runs him off. It's like, now's our time. We don't even do anything. We just grab our stuff out of the truck and go. And Mitch was Mitch was our driver at that point. And we ended up just going right towards him. We cut distance. And then as we started to approach a different opening, every time we'd hit that other opening, we would just stop. And the second to last time we stopped, I just kind of told Nick a quick game plan and a suggestion of, like, how to you know, how we were going to quietly walk through this snow. We got to that next spot to where we could basically see where we last saw him. And it was that same deal. I was just trying to buy us some time. So I changed the, I was changing the uh, battery on the microphone. Because I sometimes get a little bit to where I'm like, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. And I won't give it that two minutes. So it was my, my way of like buying some time. Mm-hmm. So I put this, I'm putting this battery in. And as I'm doing that, I hear, Burr same exact thing that happened in the story before with you and i look up and there he's like already popped out of the brush uh, 80 yards away 100 yards away and he just came walking right at us and this time we had a decoy on the bow which certainly helped the situation i don't think he would have done that had we not had that decoy but again like we didn't have a ton of cover Mm -hmm. This isn't an all-day setup type of cover. This isn't we're covered from here, we're covered from here. It's basically we got a little bit of back cover, a little bit of brush in between us and him, just just very fine stem stuff too, nothing that's solid. 
but because we have the decoy and just enough cover to break up the scene and we were wearing snow camo too which i think helped the buck walked all the way to us and turned broadside at 15 yards <laughs> and it's like that's just, like again where where are you getting this any other time of the year yeah it's not happening it's just I think it also is. knowing where the doe is is probably yeah. one of the most important things. Is like as long as she stays put, he's not going anywhere. So as long as you don't spook her, he's probably going to stick around unless unless he just sees that you're a human. Then he might try to cor- corral her out of there. But if she sees you, she's probably hightailing it somewhere else, and he's going wherever she goes. But also don't necessarily worry about bumping other deer either, I don't think. Like, for example... Um, if you're, if you're moving in and you bump a satellite like that, that isn't probably going to mess things up. A satellite running out of there probably isn't going to make him decide to just take off and run either. That's mm-hmm. risky for him in my opinion. Yeah. Like if he starts running away, he might just pick up more bucks along the way. Mm-hmm. He's, they're more likely to stay. I think that's what we're dealing with right here is like, they're just stuck. Mm-hmm. They, they're safe there. Yep. You know, all the other deer Nothing's left. Nothing's bothering them. No. Yet. And until something does, they're just going to probably keep hanging out there. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, as far as the doe goes, too, and the bumping the deer, the one thing that I've heard, like, Jared from Whitetail Adrenaline talk about, and I've seen you and Ted do it even in October, is, like, bumping a deer and just going in the direction he went. I guess Ben and I did it during gun season, too. But now, specifically, it's like, if that buck were to just take off running, like let's say we didn't know they were there, they were on public somewhere, and we were just walking through, walking down through there, and all of a sudden, boom, buck and a doe jump up. It's like, okay, same thing as you like, probably should always do, but it's like look at the map and say, where's the next place they're going? Three, four, or 500 yards away roughly, and, and depending on what scale of whatever you're hunting. Next available cover, basically. Yep. Whatever spot makes sense you know, on a map or, you know, whatever you're looking at is generally, I mean, you can, you can nail it down pretty good with not a ton of experience. I mean, if if you've seen, you know, areas that deer tend to bed in, just start slowing down when you get close to that. Now you, now you know that there is a buck and a doe in that direction. So it's worth your time to just be moving at a way slower speed than what you were before. And maybe you go in there grunting. Yeah. Right. Maybe head in their direction grunt. Yeah rattle a little yeah just be trying to sound like a deer or some sort of animal the whole time not like a human Mm -hmm. just like but yeah i would try probably try to be building up some sort of sequence you know you could you could be doing all kinds of animal like uh deer noises you could be pretending you're a buck and a doe and raking and grunting and snort wheezing rattling eventually you know just kind of built it up don't do it all at once but just kind of be trying to paint a picture you know as soon as you think you might be with an earshot of where they're at and then if nothing comes in for half hour or so, just push, you know, another however many yards in that direction, basically, and uh, earshot or, you know, next next cover in that direction. And I, I think something that, as you do this more, something that starts to happen is you get this instinct about you where you're like, I'm not hearing anything, they're not there. Or I'm not seeing anything or maybe even smelling, as weird as that may sound, like, it's not right they're not here keep going Mm -hmm. and like there just becomes this i guess level of uh confidence that you gain as you do it more to where it's just like hmm something's not right we're we're burning time here we need to catch up with them and i think that that's one of those things that if you continue to do it failing a couple times having success failing whatever if you do that a few times all of a sudden you're just like yeah i know what to do here let's Mm -hmm. keep moving like, ah, this isn't it. This isn't it yet. I mean, knowing one's in a direction, you get set up, you make a call. Generally, these things happen fast, too. Like, in both of these examples, it's like you had, in the 2021 example, you had just got to that tree. Mm-hmm. Like, you were still standing up, I think, when I heard the grunt. You were still kind of coming through that vine or whatever that you were crawling under. And the same thing with Nick and I. I mean, we hadn't been in that spot for not five minutes, if not you know like two Mm -hmm. and they happen quick and again they're going to give you some sort of sound whether that be just the sound of them walking grunting or thrashing their way to you they're generally giving you some sort of sound so listening is important but that also means stopping frequently like that's Mm -hmm. another big part of the go five or ten yards stop and i 
I've always just created this like little rule in my head is like, if I'm going more than a couple of steps at a time, I'm probably going too fast, especially in like crunchy, you know, like leaf matter. Mm -hmm. If it's one, two, three, I need to stop and listen. Because even if I don't have my cover yet, if I start to hear something, then I know that I got to dart to my cover and be ready here. Yeah. Or, you know, quickly, swiftly move to that cover. I don't think you want to stop and listen for long periods of time in the wide open, but it's never a bad idea to just hear something, keep your composure if you hear it, and then start to get yourself prepped for that shot. Mm -hmm. Maybe that does adjust the way that you view cover. Like maybe you thought you were going to come into it this way, the deer being that way, but now all of a sudden you hear him crunch over here, and you're like, okay, i got to approach this cover this way. And those are the the in-the-heat-of-the-moment decisions that – I live for. I love that. <laughs> like you're like sweating, like the back, mm-hmm. the hair on the back of your neck standing up. You're like, I'm nervous. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's it's funny when we're making these stocks, man. Like y- y- there he's up. Yeah. Push your bowl. Push her into pub. I'm tired sitting here. I want to hunt you. I'm tired doing this podcast, Jacob. I want to hunt him. <laughs> Oh, no, he said I'll lay down right back down. <laughs> he said I'm tired of chasing you. Yeah, shoot. Hmm. What a crazy scene. <laughs> and that's lockdown for you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're sitting on the public land and he's on the private, maybe you're wasting your whole day. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, shoot, I can't believe it. We've been sitting here for like three hours now just hoping. Just hoping. Yeah. Anyway, that's about that's about an hour of talking, roughly. I guess we could probably wrap things up. Is there anything that you want to final final thoughts or? I guess if people have questions about this, like I think you know, there's plenty of things to specifically talk about. If people have more questions, I just don't know what. I feel like I'm still in the giving people confidence mm-hmm. to do it phase of it yeah i mean the the thing is we got several videos about it now i mean try to just rattle them off the top of your head and just watch those and observe the deer more than anything i mean pay attention to maybe some of the things we're doing but it's also situational when it comes to what you're gonna have to do in the heat of the moment i think a lot of it is just reading the deer's body language and making the making the move from there basically josh so holt said something to me that i really like he said the reason it's like the reason that you like hunting off the ground in that style is it's like a broken play. Mm-hmm. It's like all of a sudden like all the strategy is off. It's just playing the instinct. Like if you're a quarterback for example and you're running down the field and you know you got your running back to your right and you know you got a blocker in front of you. Okay, baby, now we're playing, right? <laughs> or if you're playing if you're playing defense and all of a sudden you, you bust through the line and it's just you and the quarterback, it's just like now it's just instinct. Now it's just you got to make the play. Mm-hmm. And I think to me that is what's fun about it. Yeah. This, when one's walking down the pipe in your tree stand setup or even in your ground setup for that matter, don't get me wrong, it's fun. And when you shoot him, like well, the buck that you shot in, in, in Iowa this season, mm-hmm. yeah, man. I mean, that's fun. <laughs> like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And there's still a hectic bit to it. But it's like, on the other hand, it's like that one that you called in with Hayden mm-hmm. or the one that we got in 2021. Like, those ones are intense. And, like, that's the type of stuff that you feel uncomfortable doing it. Don't get me wrong, man. There's nerves that mm-hmm. come along with this. It's not like we're just out there like, oh, we've got him right in the bag. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, I'm feeling sweaty, you know. Yeah. I'm feeling un- – I'm nervous. I'm uncomfortable a little bit. But that that ultimately, when you're done with it, just that's you the know fun some, part. I mean, if you got a visual or so, had a visual or heard, I mean, you know something's probably about to happen, I yeah. think, is a big part of it is like – you, you know, whether good or bad, something <laughs> something's about to happen. <laughs> something's going to happen. That's right. Especially when you got a big, thick neck buck with a stinky doe. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, hopefully uh, we can drop you a picture here at the end of this with us with this big, big magnificent deer. But he's going to have to do a lot of things right before 
we even have the chance to do anything right so mm -hmm. thanks for listening thanks for watching hope you guys enjoyed it and if you have questions about the lockdown let us know and we'll try to like you know target that a little bit more specifically or if you have any questions about anything coming up here the rest of this season we'd love to talk about it and answer your questions so thanks for tuning in and thanks jacob for taking the time to enjoy this lockdown <laughs> <laughs> i am enjoying it this is fun to watch oh, it's fun i mean even if we can't hunt them it's always just interesting to learn absolutely yeah observe it too if you got the dime that if you got coyote it. coming in on them is cool mm -hmm. that's probably the highlight mm -hmm. of it and also, if you find one in a weird spot, don't be afraid. Like if it's on private, don't be afraid to ask permission, because a lot of times they are going to be in a weird spot that somebody probably wouldn't think about hunting typically. Mm -hmm. So it's always worth asking. I feel like we got denied today, but felt like we could have easily, just as easily, got permission. So yeah, and if they run to a different property, we'll probably try again. Mm -hmm. But all right, guys, thanks for watching. See you on the next one.